Okay, Anthony, thank you very much indeed. So um, it won't come as a great surprise to everybody to, that I'm going to speak about links this morning. Uh, what is as bit of a surprise is working out how I move these on. I think I have to do that. Um, so I was reading this week that, um, uh, uh, well, I didn't uh, know that when uh, Isaac Newton published his famous uh, Principia, uh, considered to be one of the um, uh, the greatest scientific publications of all time, that actually he faced an incredible amount of hostility and scepticism about his theories around um, uh, around gravity. And it won't come as a surprise to the physicians to learning that as a surgeon, um, I'm putting Isaac Newton up at the same time as a surgical talk. Um, and I think there are seven or eight of us uh, um, present this morning, all of whom have been... Um, working with links and implanting links since um, the, the relatively early days. And, and we've been doing so in isolation to a large extent. And the, uh, given the magnitude of the problem that there is with patients suffering with refractory symptoms of uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, links has not really um, caught on and, and been as, uh, as, as widely taken up as we would have thought. And you may have seen this published in the BGS. This is kind of the typical uh, response that we had from the uh, surgical colleagues um, who find every way to, uh, uh, to say that what we're doing is wrong. You may also have seen the response that um, some of us wrote to it. But meanwhile, uh, all of us um, involved in links have been carrying on, uh, working out what works, what doesn't work, who are the right patients, uh, how to manage those patients and how to adapt the technology. Um, and, and actually, we're rather aberrant compared with the rest of the world, where 40-odd thousand patients, more than 40 thousand, have, uh, have undergone surgery. So we've, we've learned to adapt uh, what we do from starting off with relatively small height attorneys, uh, getting more, um, a little bit, a little bit, um, pushing the, 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 the envelope, if you like, to larger hiatus hernias, uh, and um, learning all the time. So what I thought I would do today is actually just try and address some of the specific criticisms which we've faced over the last 13 years now um, uh, around safety, around the fact that there is no RCT data or long-term data. And then uh, the second bit, just talking a little bit about the issue of uh, assessment of motility prior to surgery and what we can do about managing perhaps the biggest problem which can affect patients after links, which is dysphagia. So let's just talk a little bit about safety first. So um, the big uh, anxiety that everybody had was, well, are we setting up setting up a, another disaster uh, similar to that that was Angel Chick from the 1980s? And those of uh, you who are old enough to remember um, uh, will know that this 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 was a problem. But that, of course, um, uh, didn't take regard of the fact that Lynx was designed specifically. The uh, engineering was designed specifically to um, uh, negate. Um, uh, the problems that was caused by Angel Chick. Um, so there's been data now uh, over the devices introduction 13 odd years ago, which has specifically looked at that. And in the early days, in fact, up until about, I think, 2017, every single implant around the world was subjected to um, uh, uh, recording of the data on a, on, a, on a registry, initially brought out by Torax and subsequently J&J. &J. And this was published in 2017, looking at every single implant around the world over five years from 20, uh, uh, 2012. So that's 3,000 odd implants. Um, median implant uh, duration at the time of the study of 1.4 years, but over 1,000 more than two years. And the first thing is there were no deaths, life-threatening events, device malfunctions reported. And, and I think Nick Maynard talked about Sharaz's um, review of Nissan uh, um, data. And we know that the complication rate following Nissen uh, and fundoplication is probably in the order of 10% or thereabouts. Somewhere between 2 and 3% of people uh, underwent removal of the device, most commonly for dysphagia. Um, and the erosion rate, this great fear 
uh, was 0.15% without any migrations. And those that underwent removal, the vast majority, uh, nearly 90% within the first two years. So it seemed to be a problem that could occur earlier on. And remember, this data went back to relatively early in the, um, in, in the evolution of, of uh, links. And actually, year by year, the number of explantations reduced from six odd percent to under three percent. Um, and the overwhelming reason, uh, dysphagia um, accounting for explantations in over one and a half percent of all patients. And I think, as I'm going to explain earlier on, almost certainly this reduction over time is because of, we've learned how to manage dysphagia better. But going back to erosion, um, uh, as, I, uh, as I said earlier on, this, this was actually published subsequently um, with, a, with a revision of that registry data, uh, nearly 10,000 odd, uh, odd, odd patients, in which there were um, 29 erosions. Um, and almost half of those were in a size 12 device. Now, remember, for those who, don't, uh, who aren't surgeons, the device comes in uh, in different sizes, um, and uh, that is tailored to the size of the esophagus. So um, we, this size 12 has now been, it's been removed from the market for many years. And, and, and over time, it seems like uh, we are not setting up this problem uh, of more and more problems, come, of, of problems with erosion coming um, to the fore. So I think as far as erosion is concerned, we, we put the problem to, to, to bed. But then um, in this uh, Bono, Luigi Bonavina's series, which was published just this year, uh, he implanted the first links back in, uh, 20, uh, to, in 2007. And he looked at his 350 odd patients in his entire series in two groups, those up to defoiled up to six years, and then subsequently six to 12 years. All of the six erosions in the early years were in the size 12 device. And over time, he evolved his technique from using the sizing device to implanting at the size that the sizing device said he should use to implanting larger than that, from up to two clicks larger initially, and then subsequently three clicks. And in the, in the later years, uh, having changed those surgical techniques, there were no erosions at all. So um, I think that's put the, the, the safety issues firmly to bed. So what about the issue of a lack of an RCT? Well, last year, a, an RCT was published uh, um, that uh, randomized patients either to PPIs or to links. And these were patients, all of whom had failed treatment of regurgitation with ezomeprazole 20 milligrams daily. I should add, that attempts to recruit previously to a Nissen or a fundification versus Lynx um, uh, study failed because we couldn't get funding from the MRC or in the United States because patients uh, wouldn't actually um, uh, consent to be randomized to the fundification arm. But anyway, in, in this study, uh, the, uh, uh, they, they looked at outcomes in terms of symptoms, uh, um, and um, those patients at six months who continued on twice daily PPIs, having elevated to twice daily, had continued regurgitation, could then convert to the surgical arm. So followed at one year, uh, there once again were no, no serious events, no migrations, no erosions. And uh, when uh, assessed, um, when P distal... Um, uh, esophageal pH was assessed, there were significant reductions in baseline and those who underwent Lynx implantation. Um, interestingly, there was not normalization in all patients, um, but uh, it was decreased very significantly. Um, and in terms of symptom control, well, those patients who underwent uh, Lynx, whether at the start of the, of the randomization or who crossed over at six months, um, somewhere north of 90% enjoyed significant or complete resolution of their symptoms, whereas those who continued on once or twice daily PPIs uh, enjoyed much less control of their symptoms. So obvious differences. And, um, sorry, 
Um, and I should point out that um, another interesting uh, adjunct was that dysphagia reduced rather than increased following surgery, as did bloating. Uh, both halved more or less in terms of their uh, in terms of their incidence. And finally, from this study, um, we all uh, have been brought up to believe that actually response to PPIs di dictates outcome following surgery and lack of response means that, surg that surgery probably won't be so effect effective. But in this study, that was not the case. So looking at both regurgitation and heartburn, those who responded and those who didn't respond to PPIs prior to surgery actually enjoyed pretty similar outcomes following surgery. So lack of response to PPIs or poorer response to PPIs doesn't necessarily dictate outcome. Um, so then longer term outcomes. Well, this is uh, the Bonavina study I alluded to earlier on, which I have to say, incidentally, I'm very uh, pleased to see was the first author was Signor Ferrari. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, 335 odd patients um, followed either up to six years and a smaller number followed from six to 12 years. And it was the sort of standard, uh, relatively small hiatus hernias, but some larger ones as well. So the key findings, I think, from this study were firstly, that compared to baseline, um, the quality of life was significantly reduced um, in the long term. And uh, when measured at each year, uh, um, that was the case. And in fact, um, uh, clinical success, which was defined um, either if a more than 50% reduction in, in the HRQL or stopping PPIs completely. Overall, at a median of nine years following surgery, 70 odd percent made that criteria. And I, and I think, again, if you compare that to all the data on fundification uh, and the data which we saw earlier on from Sherez's study, you know, 60 odd percent of patients following fundification will be back on the PPIs. So this seems to suggest that Lynx is superior. And, and, and similarly, uh, looking at the objective data um, in terms of acid reduction and distal acid exposure, significant reductions as well. So, I now just want to talk a little bit about, uh, about dysphagia and the management of dysphagia. Um, so this is the sort of the Achilles heel, I think, of Lynx. And up to, in some reports, 80 odd percent of patients will report dysphagia following Lynx. And, you know, uh, in some series, a third or thereabouts of patients undergo dilatation. And, and as I said, from uh, the registry data that I showed you earlier on, the biggest reason for explantation remains dysphagia, uh, is dysphagia. Now, I, I don't know about the other surgeons on, 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 at the meeting here today. I don't recognize this 31%. I think that's uh, um, very, very high. And in my experience, the number is somewhere more between two to 5%. But anyway, this is what's published in the, in the literature. So, uh, Blair Job's group from Pittsburgh specifically looked about looked at his experience of dysphagia and the management of how, what he had learned, and and tried to see whether they could identify any specific risk factors in advance of surgery which predicted for dysphagia. Um, of note, uh, eighty eight odd percent were satisfied. The vast majority, well over eight, ninety percent, were PPI free. Um, and uh, a significant uh, proportion, over three quarters, were um, had uh, uh, normalization of, of acid exposure. Um, but they had high numbers of patients with dysphagia, a third, in the immediate postoperative period. And at three months, which they defined as postoperative dysphagia, um, uh, 15 odd percent. But again, the interesting thing is that this was less than those reported preoperatively. Um, but nonetheless, a significant number of patients at three months had problems. Um, and 30 odd percent underwent at least one dilatation. Um, a 40 odd percent underwent two, 34 percent underwent eight. Um, so there were significant numbers of dilatations performed. Of particular interest, 24 patients, they dilated 
early on within eight weeks, but only a very small number of those had resolution of their dysphagia, whereas those patients that they, they dilated after eight weeks, uh, it was more than twice as successful. And they ended up removing um, nearly 2% of the devices specifically because of persistent dysphagia. So they tried to identify firstly what, uh, if any, were the predicting factors. Um, and we, we, we know, don't we, that um, uh, Johnson & Johnson and Torax originally told us that we shouldn't be implanting uh, if uh, patients had a low MDA. Um, this data was originated originally by, by taking a, a pig's esophagus, putting a lynx around the bottom of it, and then filling it up with water and seeing what pressure was required to distract the bead. So not really uh, physiological. Um, and, and perhaps not surprisingly, they found that MDA did not predict whether patients developed dysphagia or not. But what they did find is that firstly, absence of a large parasophageal, uh, large hernia did, um, that uh, poor peristalsis, uh, it, it, as defined in less than 80% of swallows, um, and most importantly, preoptive dysphagia. And of course, we know that from the Nissen era, don't we? That if you have dysphagia before an operation, you're more likely to have dysphagia after the operation. Um, and then they went on to actually look at uh, device size and its implication for dysphagia. And undoubtedly, in terms of persistent dysphagia, the smaller the device, the more likely you were to have problems with swallowing, and the larger the device, uh, there was a progressive trend towards less problems with swallowing, but to some extent at the expense of normalization uh, of, uh, uh, of pH, in, uh, of distal esophageal pH. So undoubtedly, this has changed the way we work in so far as we tend to implant larger devices. And they, they actually look temporarily over their change in practice. Um, and, and firstly, looking at advising people to eat normally. So originally, we used to say to people, you should take the same advice that we, we give people after fundification, uh, which is that you should um, uh, eat sloppy foods. But now, now we tell them that they should eat normally. And this caused a significant reduction in the prevalence of dilation. And then uh, uh, minimizing early dilatation, reduce that dilatation rate further, and then reduce it or increasing the implant size, once again, uh, reducing um, the, the necessity to, um, to dilate. And again, a really big change in, in change of practice in terms of um, uh, 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 sizing slightly bigger, reducing the dysphagia rate. So, um, uh, this business of size and has uh, has also been looked at. I'm just going to flick through those slides, but I just thought I would show you show this. This was published. Well, it's it's actually not pub been published yet, but it's it's been accepted for publication. Uh, and and what they uh, what they showed is a relatively small study. Um, there were only just uh, nearly 70 patients, uh, and it was retrospective. Um, but nonetheless. They, they separated the two sizes to, between those with the 12, sorry, between 12 and 14 beads and larger sizes, 15 to 17 beads. And they found that there were significant differences in terms of, of dysphagia. But once again, uh, also significant differences in terms of the use of PPI. So there clearly is a balance between patients uh, experiencing dysphagia and uh, maintaining good control of symptoms. And this is reflected in the use of PPI usage, but nonetheless, two years after surgery, 80 uh, odd percent remaining PPI free, which is consistent with the rest of the data. So the last thing I just want to talk a little bit about is to return to this business of, uh, of preoperative manometry. Um, because as I've said, uh, you know, the, the caution is that we should be careful in implanting in patients who have poor distal esophageal amplitude. So we actually looked at a, um, a group of our patients, uh, 20, uh, 21 uh, odd patients who had poor motility that didn't reach the, the normal accepted threshold. Um, and we used the protocol which um, has been described um, previously of um, a month's course of high dose PPIs with azithromycin 
which as I'm sure you, you know, is a motilin uh, agonist and has been demonstrated to improve esophageal motility. So we gave people this for um, uh, a, um, we gave this for a month and then we retested them. We tested their motility again. Um, and what we showed quite clearly is that a significant number of patients, 16 out of 21, enjoyed a rise in their recorded MDA. Uh, uh, and that was to above 30 millimeters of, of, of mercury, which I use as the threshold at which I'll implant. Um, and um, uh, you can see there were really significant rises in what we recorded. Um, and then when we looked at these patients postoperatively, in terms of their dysphagia scores, there was no difference between the two groups, um, uh, but significant improvements in uh, the quality of care between pre and post-op. So um, I think for us, this has changed our practice in so far as um, in patients who are keen on undergoing links, but have poor uh, distal motility. Uh, we put them through this protocol and we'll find a sizable number of them will then uh, um, exceed the threshold um, and we can we will implant without any downside at all. Of course, it does beg the, the question about whether there is any value in measuring MDA and measuring DCI at all. Um, and I think that remains an open question. So finally, this is the algorithm which uh, the Joe um, group have suggested uh, for those patients with dysphagia. Um, if patients develop dysphagia earlier on, it's really important, really important to get the meeting normally and avoid dilatation. You have to nurse these patients through that post-operative period. They're very needy, very, they can be really difficult, but you, you must avoid intervention earlier on. And only once you get to eight weeks, consider dilatation. Um, and those who, who have persistent uh, uh, dysphagia, um, then it's at that stage that you could consider dilatation. Um, now, there is anecdotal uh, practice of using steroids. Um, people have their all sorts of different regimes. Um, uh, there is no uh, evidence base for that, but uh, some people say it works very well. But if the, after there's no response after three dilatations, then consider uh, explantation. So uh, I think in conclusion, MDA may be a value in predicting dysphagia, but you should think about azithromycin. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of patients considering for surgery, regurgitation is clearly much better treated with MDA. We've got very good data now, uh, much better treated with links than continuing PPIs, which just don't work. Um, and we've got long-term data now, um, which suggests that there is good maintained symptom control. And I think we should think more about how we manage these patients uh, intraoperatively in terms of sizing and what we do postoperatively, as I've just described. So I hope that's of help to, to everybody um, who is involved in implanting these patients. Thank you very much, Nick. That was wonderful as usual. Um, the common theme that seems to be coming across there was, uh, is bigger better? Um, I don't know if you, that was the message you wanted to get across, but on that line, uh, Phil Woodland well, would like to know. I've that belief, Anthony, but I know you haven't, but anyway. Um... <laughs> um, Phil Woodland would like to ask, what size dilatation do you suggest? Um, well, what I, what I think the normal, it, it does depend to some extent on what size implant has been uh, put in in the first place but I would usually start relatively small. You see, the reason that people, it's thought theoretically that the reason people develop dysphagia is because of development of a, a fibrous capsule around the implant. And if you're not swallowing normally in the early days, then that capsule is restrictive. So what you're trying to do is to encourage patients to open the device in the early days so they don't get these swallowing difficulties and that capsule isn't restrictive but subsequently you have to rupture that capsule. So it does depend on what, in some extent, what size device you're using. I would go incrementally, I'd start small, probably at 18 millimeters uh, on the first occasion. If that doesn't work, then I'd go up to 20. 
I think you picked up, uh, obviously, the work that we, we've done with um, azithromycin and PPI. We don't know whether it is the azithromycin or the PPI that has its effect on uh, reducing inflammation, improving motility. But, um, you know, I think the important thing from that study is that you've got a group of patients that are assessed off PPI because you want to prove their reflux diagnosis, but their reflux may be causing the dysmotility. Uh, how has that kind of changed the way you think about selecting patients in, and tailoring your surgery? Well, I think, um, as, as everybody knows, um, this concept of tailoring surgery based upon preoperative um, monometry is, is nonsense. There is no evidence at all that it, it can predict outcomes. Um, and I'm, I'm, I remain quite sceptical that those, the study that suggests that maybe this funny ratio between normal swallows and, and multiple swallows, um, that, that maybe that can predict it. I, uh, it just flies in the face of all the other evidence. So the bottom line is, I just protect myself, if I'm honest, in terms of not implanting patients uh, under 30 millimeters of mercury of MDA, simply because that's a caution, which uh, Johnson & Johnson print on the, uh, on the instruction leaflet. Um, I think the, interest, the only interesting thing I would say is that I have become a little bit, a little bit more aggressive, but um, I didn't talk about the fact that all the patients who had virtually absent motility that you recorded didn't improve at all with the regime. So I think if they've got no motility at all, uh, I don't think there's any point putting them through the um, putting through the protocol, and I wouldn't implant them. Great. Just one last question, if you can be brief. Nick Maynard said, "How important is sizing? Having abandoned the smallest sizes, are you moving towards the principle of making it as loose as you can, i.e., the same principles for fund duplication?" Um, well, again, it's a mixture of the, the, the objective use of the sizer. So we have moved to uh, sizing it three, type, three clicks larger, um, but also a degree of subjectivity and judgment as well. But the general point is, yes, we have moved it to being larger.